Well, hello and welcome back to the garden. I'm here in the greenhouse at the moment because I brought my broad beans and sweet peas out here from the kitchen, from the shelving where they've been growing so far. But they are getting a bit leggy now, so they can do with more sunlight. Now, I don't think I leave them here overnight just yet. I don't think I have a vermin problem inside the greenhouse, but I'm not also taking any chances. So I'm just bringing them out here for the daytime so they can get as much natural sunlight so they don't keep growing and searching upwards as uh, desperately as they are at the moment. But then for the nighttime, I'll still take them back into the house. Let's stay here in the cozy a greenhouse and talk about some seeds and what other jobs I'm planning for myself for month of March. We are going to be busy because from now onwards and especially this month as well is a busy busy month. So all sorts of seed sowings, actual jobs outside in the garden because the days are so much longer and you can really see the growth now on the trees, the buds opening fresh leaves. Tulips are starting to open as well for me here. And overall, uh, yeah, it's going to be busy season, but I am going to pace myself a bit with some of the jobs that I'll be doing because the weather is still not so warm. You can get a March that from the get go, it's really mild. And then you can get a March that's raining constantly and you just cannot get outside. But at the moment, we're having quite chilly temperatures during the day still. So at least for the next couple of weeks, going to pace with some of the jobs and maybe stay indoors a little bit more, or at least if they're outdoor works to do something real proper physical. Um, like I did last week when I was moving the soil for the cottage garden. And yesterday was one of those days where I really tested my physical ability and stamina. And because of that, and I'll show you what I did uh, shortly, but because of that, I will have to take it easier today. So as I said, with month of March, everybody is going to be so busy with seed sowing. And rightly so, because obviously the temperatures are rising, um, the days are much longer now. But this year I am going to be so much pickier with the vegetables that I'll be sowing or trying to be growing in the kitchen garden. I'm going to be definitely more selective because obviously you have the enthusiasm of really trying to grow everything at the same time and failing and succeeding. But it's more about retaining that pace or making that work around overall um, your life. So overall this year is definitely I, and hopefully from here onwards, I'm going to try to make it as manageable as possible. But month of March, if I just think across the board of all the months of the year and what I might be up to in the garden on those months. Month of March really stands out to me for three big reasons. <laughs> and one would be sowing the seed tomatoes. Second would be planting potatoes. And third is actually doing the spring clean or tidy up. So like so cutting back the nipita. I'm so looking forward to that. And tidying up the herbaceous bed, that's sort of the in-between bed between kitchen garden and the rose garden. They're just those three that I'm genuine. They, that, in my mind, is the start of spring. And then at the very end of March, or just even early April, when the ornamental cherry starts flowering, and from there onwards, obviously, then everything is going to be so green and you'll have flowers, different flowers popping up in different parts of the garden. So from there onwards, it really gets going. And with likes of the tomato sowing and potato planting, I can do in any weather, really. Then for them, yeah, the spring clean type of job the herbaceous border and nipita, I really would look forward to 
a nice warm spring day when there's even maybe hopefully a bit of sunshine out there and really take my time and enjoy that process. There's just something about that process I really thoroughly enjoy. So today I'm not going to be planting any potatoes. I'm going to start my second lot of potatoes from St. Patrick's Day onwards. So middle of March onwards probably. And I've done already my very first two buckets a couple of weeks ago, which were Duke of York and Red Duke of York. And I'm glad to say that the Red Duke of York leaves are up. They're come through the soil and aren't they pretty? They are just so beautiful. The colours in it are just stunning. So delighted with that. And yeah, from sort of middle of March onwards, then I'll keep um, planting more and more the first earlies and second earlies and then April the main crop. But today I can sow some tomato seeds and also I'm not going to be doing like 50 varieties. I'm actually going to bring it back to one, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six varieties tomatoes for this year. And last year I grew five different varieties. Lucky Leprechaun, Sweet Million, San Marzano 2, then Moneymaker, and again apricot salix and I repeated growing that apricot salix last year I'm also going to do, be doing it this year is because it was just a tomato that overall our whole family love to eat and it does look a bit different but also it's just a little bit special it's um, a, it's an Italian heritage variety so it isn't a, a seed that you'd come across that often but I'm also repeating all the others from last year. So the Lucky Leprechaun, which is an Irish heritage uh, variety, then Sweet Million, and it was the most successful variety for us um, as far as harvests go. And just that continuous abundance, it was just a joy to grow and to eat. And then I'm also going to do the San Marzano 2 again and the Moneymaker. Again, Moneymaker, a huge abundance of fruit. And then I'm also going to add another tomato. And this, as by, just by the name, it's really well known. It's a cherry tomato, yellow colored, orangey yellow colored fruit. And this otherwise would be considered a, a hybrid, so F1 variety. And I've grown it before, but that was pre the greenhouse when I used to grow it in our kitchen. And again, my boys loved it. For me, I think they were just maybe too small of a fruit. Now, it could have been just because of how I was growing them. And I preferred the sweet million actually at that time. But I'm definitely going to try it because this variety is not the hybrid. So this is Sun Gold Select 2. And what it is, it is an open pollinated variety. It is not fully stable, which means that it can still put out um, a different colored fruit from the orangey yellow looking ones. So I think uh, the color that can come through is red because it's, as I said, it's not um, a hybrid. It is an open pollinated version of it. But I will look forward to growing that. And why I do want to grow more of the open pollinated varieties is because I can save my own seeds. So obviously with hybrids, you can't. With open pollinated heirloom varieties, you can. And it's just, it's very easy, A, very easy to save a tomato seed, plus, it just saves you money because you've grown the fruit already. So yeah, looking forward to growing that. I have already sieved my compost and I do like sieving it. I think it's just a habit now I've gotten into because I'm still continuously always finding bits of rubbish or plastic or then just overall big lumps of soil in it that it will be difficult for young seedling roots to be able to push themselves through. So I'd rather give them a nice fibrous and loose material to grow in. So out of all the varieties for this year, four are going to be red varieties and two are going to be sort of golden orangey colours.
We're here in the orchard right next to the big pallet compost base because yesterday I was very busy. Now my busyness relates back to last sort of spring or summer when we were trialing to see if we can start creating a wildflower meadow in part of our field just as a means of grass management because we have an awful lot of grass and obviously in Ireland being such a mild and wet climate especially here in southwest is that the grass pretty much grows 12 months of the year so we are constantly cutting grass even in December and January as long as there's no frost or snow down the grass sort of just keeps steadily growing so it needs to be uh, kept at a manageable height and obviously as long as it's not soggy wet as well so that the tractor lawnmower can actually go on the field. But back to why am I here in front of these compost bays. So this bay I built in January 2023 and obviously I filled that up with all the materials whatever grass cuttings, leaves, things, what I had, all that got filled up. So I, my thinking process was that this soil now that has all composted down because it had reduced down to half the height it used to be, um, I can move that on. So I can use that soil or compost from here on the kitchen garden beds. Then all the materials from the second bay that I been gathering throughout the year can be moved over to the first bay. Also another side of the story is that we have hens as you might know and for their coop we're actually using a deep litter method. So that just means that um, for their droppings we keep just adding on fresh layer of uh, wood shavings, sawdust and that just keeps layering up throughout the winter months and it just provides insulation for them, it just provides bacteria for their gut and it just overall keeps them healthier as well. And all that material throughout winter has been piling up so the hen coop needs to be emptied out as well. So my thinking was that between all the grass and the moss and any of the plant material, the green material that's coming from the field where the meadow is going to be. Plus then the sawdust, which is obviously brown material, so that's carbon, will be perfect as a combination for the empty bay. So that was my thinking. That was my plan and I was ready for that action. And I even did a bit of preparation in the kitchen garden before I started with the pallet compost base here. I removed some of the plastic, hunted for slugs and snails and did a bit of weeding. Now I've always found making your own compost in an open space quite tricky. Um, either you have too much green material, you, you have too much brown material, you don't have enough brown material and the biggest issue is that my compost always ended up getting really wet and really soggy um, or I never had enough brown material and this time now I can see obviously the covers did wonderfully kept it dry but they kept it too dry I didn't add physically water onto those piles I emptied out as much of that dry, uncomposted material from the first bay. I took out as much of that real dense, heavy compost from the very bottom layer.
And then I just started to layer back all the materials, first from the, the fresher compost bay, then I had fresh grass clippings, and then I obviously the material that already came out of this bay. Now, luckily the soil in the second bay was actually a much better sort of composting stage. So I'm taking that because that was gradually filled, so bit by bit. And because I suppose it's a little bit more in an open position as well. Maybe some of the rain was able to get into it, but at least there was a lot of nice healthy worms inside there, the tiger worms that we want for the compost. So I, I was glad to see that. So it just kept layering between those three materials, the second compost bay, the grass, and then obviously the brown material from, from the first bay until all of it was gone. And then it was back onto the field to get the scarifier going, to get fresh grass, up from there and I had to obviously gather all that up, bring it up uh, to the base here. and then the hen coop and get the sawdust gathered up from there. And I, I literally kept going then between those two areas, one big trailer load of each. So grass, one trailer load, bring it up to the compost bays, then into the hen coop, get a trailer load of sawdust. And I literally layered them up. But I can honestly say yesterday my plans were way bigger than my muscle strength. So I was so, so tired by the end of the evening, but I was determined to get that job done. So when I'm just physically dealing with something that's, I know I'm going to be so sore for the following day and my whole body is going to be tired. I tried to power through and I said, look, at least it's that one day. I don't have to think about it, doing it again the following day and even my camera battery died. It was that long of a day. But at least I'm delighted with my achievement because at least those two bays are full to the brim again. 
and I've left the covers off them at the moment and I'm going to leave them off for a couple of weeks. So unless now I know that we're going to get like a lot of rain, um, I'm going to put covers on it. But what I probably have to do now is actually manually water them with watering cans as well, maybe a couple of um, good gallons of water um, onto it. And then another concern I suppose I have with the second bay, the, the bay that got the mix of the wood shavings from the hen coop and then the grass from the field is that these are not grass clippings, it, it has parts of roots in it. So I'm just hoping that the grass don't actually actively start growing in there. But look, we have to wait and see, we'll learn from that. So this is what I've been up to so far and what's yet to come. I'm sure I'm going to keep you updated, but if you're any bit interested in the cottage gardening side of gardening, then have a look at the next video because I've just started a cottage garden area and maybe you want to follow along on that journey with me as well. Otherwise, thanks a million for watching and we'll see you next time.